Let me also say thanks very much to the sponsors of today's event, which is on being held under the rubric of the Ground Forces Dialogue, but um, is broader than that today. Um, BAE and Northrop Grumman have both been very generous in their support of the program and have allowed us to do uh, a lot of different things that both directly and indirectly affect ground forces, so we're very uh, thankful for their support. And finally, one other little CSIS admin note, um, as you probably got those cool flyers when you came in about how we're moving to our new building, so in a couple of weeks, if you come here, I don't know what you'll find, but uh, it won't be us. So um, if you want to keep attending CSIS events, and we hope that you will, we hope you'll do that in our new space, uh, 1616 Rhode Island Northwest. So um, we hope to see you there. So with that, let me kick it off. We're very honored today to have the, uh, the Assistant Secretary of Defense for Operational Energy, I'm sorry, it's, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> uh, Sharon Burke and her colleague on the Joint Staff, Lieutenant General Bob Rourke, um, and to talk with us about the whole plethora of issues uh, around operational energy and logistics challenges and how to translate the activities that really Secretary Burke has been spearheading uh, as the first Assistant Secretary for this issue set. Um, over the last four years in her position and where that goes from here. So uh, you have their bios in your handout, but let me just say one of the pretty unique things about Secretary Burke is she's had a foot in uh, three different parts of the government that don't necessarily um, communicate all that well or all that effectively um, at very senior levels, obviously in the Defense Department, but also in the State Department and in uh, the Office of Technology Assessment, which is um, a a somewhat little known, <laughs> little known, but but very important office uh, as well. And so I think she brings a, a, both a sort of a foreign policy angle, a technical angle, and uh, an energy markets and um, and again technology angle to this whole discussion. That's that's pretty unique. General Rourke has spent his life in the managing the stuff that really matters and everything that all of us do, logistics. Um, so uh, he's recently come up here. We were talking earlier about how he fixed everything when he was at CENTCOM so that he could focus on other areas of the world when he got up to the joint staff. <laughs> um, but has um, had, had to do that in some other fairly challenging locations around the globe, um, has held command at multiple levels, and I think, uh, again, well positioned to talk to us today about what the Joint Staff is trying to do uh, to, to address the energy challenges and the logistics challenges that they face. Um, so with that, I think we're going to start with Secretary Burke and then General Rourke, and then we'll try to have a conversation with all of you. So again, thanks for coming. Well, thank you very much, Maren. And uh, I really appreciate, you know, long before I was in this job, I appreciated the convening power of CSIS, but also your personal touch on this is really, a really helpful and uh, grateful to you for doing this. And of course, very honored to be here with, with my colleague, who I think you were one of the first people that I met with in this job. You were in a very different role at the time. But I certainly, for me, it was great to know that you as a great leader for the Marine Corps, for the warfighters in CENTCOM, and now for the Joint Force, and just a great public servant all around. So it's a real pleasure to be here with you today, especially you're so new in the seat. Um, but I, I know that you know a lot about this issue. So. Um, I'm just going to give you a 10-minute overview um, of energy and, and defense and the future. And then I let Bob talk for 10 minutes about, I believe he's going to go into more specifics about prior defense priorities and capabilities, but I'll let him speak for himself. And then I, I know we've got a range of people here today um, from defense companies, energy companies, and think tanks and all over the place. So I think for us, we will really look forward to the dialogue as much as anything else. So um, I want to talk about the two ways that we are in the department looking at the, the link between energy and defense in the next 10 years. And first is in a global sense, and energy as a geopolitical issue, and how that's changing, um, and what it means for the defense mission. And then secondly, how energy supports the defense mission and how that's changing. Uh, because both of those are very important for us to understand. And I'm just going to give a few <coughs> thoughts on both of that. And it's a good time to have this kind of conversation because, of course, I don't think it's lost on anybody here that 
the department is right now in the middle of um, its most important strategy exercise with the Quadrennial Defense Review. So understanding new influences and our old influences and what they mean in the new situation, it's a good time to be having this kind of conversation. Um, and you know, as well as we're going through a lot of institutional change. So I welcome that opportunity. Now, I wanted to start, though, by saying that as we look at the future, you, you have to do that by looking at the lessons learned over the last 12 years. And I wanted to do that by reading you some pieces of an article. And I, I, it's, um, it's hard for me to read this. Um, and I know it's harder for Bob and others who've had to live it. But um, it's, you know, it's, a, it's an illustration of that you, you stand where you sit. And, uh, this is a painful article that was in Vanity Fair in December 2011, although when I went to print it, I found that the most popular article in Vanity Fair right now that's being forwarded is Kate Middleton's post-baby routines, muesli bars, homemade smoothies, and nannyless time with George. So I, if, if you want to talk about that, maybe we can just talk about that. That's, that's our next event. <laughs> right, okay. This is a, a tough article by Mark Bowden about um, a combat outpost in Afghanistan uh, that was overrun. and. It's, it's a really an article about accountability, but because I do energy in military operations, that's, that's not the part of it that got my attention. So that's the part of it I want to read to you. They're talking about this base where Task Force Rock was, um, and they are saying, it, he writes, a single partially paved road wound south toward Camp Blessing, the headquarters for Task Force Rock, 2nd Battalion, 503rd Infantry Regiment, 173rd Airborne Brigade which is important because later on maybe we can talk about some of the things we've done subsequent to this with the 173rd. Um, the battalion HQ was just five miles away in the lens of a drone, uh, but on the ground it was a perilous journey of about an hour. Perilous because ambushes and IEDs were common, skipping ahead. We're talking about a guy that had just arrived, Captain Matthew Meyer, he had only arrived the day before and he'd sketched out a basic plan for the combat outpost. So he sketched it out, and he left the supervision of the construction to First Lieutenant Jonathan Brostrom. Uh, after consultations with Meyer and the battalion commander, Bostrom had drawn up detailed maps of the new outpost on whatever scraps of paper he could find so that he could show his men sectors of fire for all of the vehicles, the placement of the Claymore mines, and the location of fighting positions, the latrine, and everything else. A small force of Afghan contractors with heavy equipment were to handle most of the construction, but they'd been delayed awaiting the completion of a road clearing mission. In the interim, the platoon itself had begun building the outpost's preliminary defenses, toiling in 100 degree heat with limited water and resources, hacking away at the baked stubborn soil. They had to take the HESCOs down to half of their height because they had to figure out how to fill them, HESCOs being the barriers that you build around a perimeter of a combat outpost. Um, all the fighting positions were makeshift. The command post was a sunken space about two feet deep. Uh, and I'm skipping around. Lacking enough men for both constructions this is the key part. Lacking enough men for both construction and patrols, Brostrom had chosen to concentrate on construction. The platoon had conducted a perfunctory patrol to scout the immediate vicinity, but that was it. And the platoon had yet to establish a useful observation post. So you can get what happened. Um, this is the opportunity cost of not thinking about how we resource operations with energy, because I can assure you that was part of the problem here, as these guys were on scraps of paper trying to figure out what their contingency base should look like. They probably had generators that were drastically oversized for the loads. They probably had one on every single load, which meant they were burning it out. They were burning through fuel. These roads were hard to access, and anybody that had to bring them that fuel was putting their lives at risk, or if they were coming by helicopter, there was a very hot zone. Um, it meant that anybody in the helicopter, these guys got attacked the next day with RPGs and other kinds of fire. You can hit a helicopter, even the Taliban can do that. So you get a picture right away of if we don't manage our resources as a platform or as a warfighting input, these are the people that pay the price. Um, and this is not something that we necessarily capture in our statistics. Um, it, it's hard to get at what the cost of this kind of problem is. So I'm not going to dwell on the lessons learned more than I think you get the point, that we have to see energy. We have to see the resources as inputs to warfighting capability and take it seriously and not just assume 
that will have what we need when we need it, where we need it, in a reliable, affordable way. And that's the central lesson learned that we're carrying forward. And uh, you think about what this means in Afghanistan, just one more thing on the lessons learned. We, you know, we're the most sophisticated, capable fighting force in the world. And I have no doubt whatsoever that we can protect movements of fuel anywhere. But that there is an opportunity cost, and sometimes it looks like that. And so if there's something we can do to lower the risk and increase the capability at the pointy edge, at the tactical edge, then we should. It's our responsibility to do that. Um, you know, we're putting, you know, it varies anywhere from 20 to 50 million gallons of fuel on the road every day in Afghanistan. And these are the conditions. These are not everywhere, but in a lot of places. And if we can take some of that risk out and make it more capable, that's what we have to do. Well, so if you take that forward going into the future, we're looking at a future threat environment where it's not just suicide bombers or IEDs that can target your combat forces and, of course, your supply lines, of course. I mean, it, since people have been waging war, your supply lines are in play. If you can get them, they're in play. And in distributed operations, they're in play. So uh, it's not just going to be suicide bombers and homemade weapons, but it's also going to be precision weapons, precision guided munitions from mines to um, RPGs to missiles, everything. So, but also computer viruses, electronic warfare. We're, we're going to face adversaries who are able to target us, both state and non-state. Um, it's going to be a threat. It's also going to be a threat to our access, which is, of course, uh, what the department is calling anti-access area denial, the ability to control where we go and keep us out in addition to actual war fighting. So that's how it looked in Afghanistan. That's how it looks going forward. This is about being able to project and sustain force for the global mission. And now let's see going forward what I actually said I was going to talk about. Um, the global energy picture and how it shapes the defense mission and then how energy actually supports the defense mission. Well, first, that global energy picture is getting a lot more complicated in ways that are fascinating. So even as mature economies increase efficiency, switch fuels, and reduce their petroleum demand, the thirst for energy, and specifically for oil and natural gas, is growing all over the world. Um, and and uh, a lot of that growth is going to be in non-OECD countries in total energy demand, it's China, India, and the Middle East that are going to account for 60% of the increase in specifically for oil, demand for oil over the next 20 years. Um, that's going to, according to the IEA, require some $37 trillion in new investment. So this is a big commitment, a big deal. And you know, the good thing there is that no one consumes energy for its own sake. You consume energy for the services it provides. And that means that this is all good news. It means that we're going to see countries develop. We're going to see people coming out of poverty. It's all good news. Um, but it also means that the global energy landscape is changing quite a bit. And I think you know, the country that's getting the most attention for redrawing the lines in this is, of course, the United States. We're the ones that are bucking the trend of more demand and less supply. Um, and I think you know, all the new production coming online in the United States was really unimaginable for a lot of people a decade ago. And I'm sure there are people here who knew that it was going to happen. And you can take us all out to lunch. Um, so f I did not see it coming uh, myself. But uh, you know, the, the understanding before was that our production peaked in 1970 and has been declining ever since, that our imports were increasing. And of course, you know, as recently as maybe five years ago, our imports hit 60%. That picture is just gone. We're, I think, the latest numbers from uh, the Energy Information Administration is we're at 36% imports. So domestic oil and gas production, the increase, us as a major producer for these hydrocarbons is just a different picture altogether. I mean, in natural gas, the biggest problem at the moment is low prices, which, you know, go figure. Um, now, so does it matter? And is it good news? Is it bad news? It's, of course it's good news. People are justifiably excited about it, about the implications for the US economy and the manufacturing sector, about jobs coming home about industry coming home or growing, about our balance of payments. I mean, just, just the trade deficit for oil alone, I think about five years ago, was about $42 billion, um, give or take half a billion. You know, that's DOD speak. Um, it's $17 billion today. I mean, that's a meaningful change for our economy, for our economic security. So this does mean something, and it is good. But there's a, 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 
an interesting question to ponder, which is, you know, so that's good, that's all well and good, but does it matter beyond that from a national security point of view? And the answer is no, it doesn't. And yes, it does. So, and we don't know as part of it. So why doesn't it matter? I think there's a real danger that all the enthusiasm for the new production um, will mask for the public and for a lot of policymakers that even as we move towards self-sufficiency here in North America, we're still going to be part of a global energy market. I mean, we're talking about a market of 90 million barrels a day um, consumed worldwide, and the trend is up, up, up. Not here, but everywhere else. So the world supply and demand trends, which are going to be driven by all of that, about that global supply and that global growing demand, is going to continue to shape our own prosperity here at home. And again, I think that gets a little bit masked in what's happening in energy markets here at home. And there's every reason to believe that we're going to still see volatility in the markets, and especially in the global oil market. So it does matter. So it doesn't matter on that, in that sense. We're still going to see some of the same kinds of things we've always seen, maybe lower amplitude. Who knows? We'll see as that unfolds. But at the same time, I think um, it matters how these trends may affect geopolitics and regional stability. And I think you know, we at the Department of Defense um, are still looking at how all these factors are going to come together and what it means. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a complicated world out there, and certainly in energy security terms, that's true. Um, you know, you're hearing things like that the Saudis might become net importers of oil by 2030, and of course Iran repeatedly threatening to close the Strait of Hormuz. Energy flashpoints in a number of places like the South China Sea changes in the, the Arctic and what that means for global relationships. But, you know, just some new considerations taking place, too, that we need to understand better and take into account is the changing relationships between energy producers and energy consumers. So consider that the U.S. is no longer the largest energy consumer and is, depending on who you talk to, is no longer the largest oil consumer. Um, China is, of course. Um, they're the largest customer in the world and the largest consumer. And what does that mean for producer-consumer relations and what does that mean for geopolitics? It's a good question. Russia is starting to look east and there's a producer-consumer relationship there along with a lot of defense sales, not necessarily to each other, but to others. And the confluence of that and what that means is a very interesting question. Um, you know, we'll, that's good enough on that, um, but also the way that these changing dynamics are changing stability. So that so-called social price of oil, which is a lot of, uh, we are one of the few countries in the world, maybe one of two, that has private ownership of the mineral rights. So everybody else goes to the state, right? And the state uses oil revenues and natural gas revenues to support all kinds of social programs. In a lot of countries, that means they need a certain price to be able to support all those commitments. What happens when the price dips below there? What if it stays below? And you know, you'll see a lot of different calculations on what various countries need the price to be. We may find out what they actually need it to be. And think about the different ways that this refracts through security. So you've got a situation in Libya right now where Libya's ability to stabilize is very much dependent on their ability to have oil revenue. But, but they need to stabilize in order to get oil revenue. <laughs> That's going to be a tough one. That's not the only place we're going to see that. We're going to see that in Egypt. Someday you'll see that in Syria. These are not big global producers, but the, f the energy they produce is essential for their own stability. Uh, I think you should keep your eye on Venezuela on that one, for sure. Uh, and that one has got significance for the global markets. These things are changing. Um, Mexico, I think, is a real bright spot there. You see, this is a, a, a nation that has uh, some changes in place as a producer. And again, this reinforces that North American self-sufficiency is going to be an interesting dynamic in this. Um, but also, you know, the issues of access to the global commons and who's most invested in that. If uh, we're not buying directly from the Persian Gulf, say, uh, but the Chinese certainly are, um, I think about 74% of the offtake from there right now is going to Asian countries. So that's an interesting question. How does that all play out? Lots of trends here that we need to take into uh, account, which is now just make a quick move over to that's a, a policy issue and an influence on the defense mission that we need to understand and that we engage in with the interagency. But the other way that we engage in these discussions is unique, which we are a big consumer. 
So we're closer to one of those nations that has to look at the relationship between energy and what, what we need to be able to do as a consumer. In fact, we consume more than about two-thirds of the nations on Earth, so it's an apt, uh, potentially apt comparison. So just as a country would be consumed about, uh, concerned about reliability and affordability of supplies, so are we. So what does that mean? Well, if you look at the defense mission right now, and again, global presence, global projection, we need the ability to disperse, maneuver, and operate over very long distances, conduct operations in remote places and a broad range of kinds of operations. That means we need to reduce our dependence on our supply lines. We need a lighter supply line to be able to support that kind of a defense mission. We need to increase that. What that means also, I think, in positive constructive terms in the defense world is we need more range, we need more endurance, we need resilience, we need more uh, loiter time, less signature, all those things. And those can all tie back to some degree to how we use energy. Um, and again, you know, coming back to the lessons of the last 12 years, we're taking them on board, but so is the rest of the world. And any potential adversaries out there have certainly seen that asymmetric or anti-access approaches is a, one way to deal with the United States. So we have to be ready for that too. Um, and how energy affects our ability to be ready for that, our costs, um, our capabilities, our risks. So uh, let me tell you a little bit more about what we're doing to deal with that uh, by we are, I mean, essentially this means we have a challenge. We have an energy challenge for our force and the, deploying our force, but we also have an opportunity. Um, we can operate that force more efficiently. We can incorporate energy and sustainment considerations into our plans and our operations and get to a more lethal, agile, adaptable, effective combat force, reduce the risks and the costs in a time of declining budgets. Because if you do this right, you get more capability, you also get less cost. So we're investing in innovations that change our energy posture and improve it. Um, and let me tell you a little bit more about some of the kinds of things we're doing. And it, again, it's so important for me to have my joint staff colleague here because there are many ways where the joint staff and the J4 has to lead the way um, if we're going to make this stick for military forces. And so just a couple of things that we're doing. Together with Lieutenant General Rourke and his predecessor, we've established a governance body, a new governance body within the department to manage operational energy issues, because we didn't before. It was an assumption. Now we do. We manage it. Um, the joint staff oversees the application of a key performance parameter for energy, and they are enforcing it in the requirements process. I think you're going to say more about that. Um, we have implemented changes in the guidance for the analysis of alternatives and the development of defense programs to show how differences in energy performance and energy flexibility give you more capability. Uh, when it comes to different kinds of energy and the way they support the mission, last year I signed out a policy for streamlining the qualification, certification, and procurement of alternative fuels. And as a department, we're focused on the goal of ensuring operational readiness, improving battle space effectiveness, and increasing flexibility in military operations and the role of fuels and alternatives in doing that. Uh, the Deputy Secretary has taken a very particular interest in this and has convened a couple of his management action groups to focus on energy and put out interim guidance for how we're going to manage this issue as a department. And there is also uh, an instruction, a DOD instruction, which will put uh, formal, lasting management infrastructure in place for how the department looks at energy. That's in process right now. Um, and will also guide, I believe, how the department, as we are looking at institutional changes, looks at energy. And then also, uh, my office oversees how the department's investing in innovation in this space. And specifically, I do have an operational energy capability fund and to date, we've really focused on, you know, this is a bridge between programs of record and where we need to fix things like that contingency base. And so we've used that money to incentivize investments in the services and make sure they're getting into programs of record so that they'll permanent institutional advantages. And then we use uh, our budget certification authority to make sure it's getting in there to, to be a check on the back end. So I think, I, that would be a good place for me to stop and let you take it over and then uh, uh, General Rourke and then get into the Q&A with the, with the group. Thanks, ma'am. I certainly appreciate that. I'm uh, 
if I have that deer in the head like uh, stare, I just realize I came out of 25 months at Central Command and <laughs> I was in the spin cycle down there for quite a bit. So I'm discovering on the Joint Staff I have a little bit, little bit of time to think. So it's uh, it's it's good to be here and read too. <laughs> but uh, uh, ma'am, I also want to thank you for the generosity. Uh, you provided us a operational energy contractor, um, retired Army Colonel who. It was quite an addition to the CENTCOM J4 staff the last uh, couple of years, and I really needed that uh, um, just to get the right focus on that. And it really was good seeing the action and the accomplishments in Afghanistan. Um, in, in a previous job where I, I met Assistant Secretary Burke uh, a couple years ago, I had responsibility for the Marine Corps facilities and installations energy. And uh, yes, the Marine Corps does have a, has several uh, pretty darn good installation initiatives for uh, renewables, uh, things like wind turbines, solar panels, a fleet of energy efficient vehicles, um, cogen plants, um, and even a landfill gas project. Uh, however, I quickly learned a couple years ago this wasn't what sold in Congress. Um, notably with the staff members we briefed before our testimonies uh, with the congressional committees. What the Congress was interested in was the operational energy piece. This is what sold them in terms of funding and support, from what I could tell. Now, that was two years ago. Uh, directly supporting the soldier, sailor, marine, airmen on the ground in either Iraq or Afghanistan to reduce their reliance on energy, notably fossil fuels, and increase their survivability is what drew headlines. Uh, the Army and Marine Corps has and, and has continued to have some very excellent small unit and base camp examples in this regard that do well today, even in Afghanistan. Um, in terms of operational effectiveness, and clearly this is just common sense to any of us in here, I don't think any commander would ever compromise effectiveness in accomplishing his or her mission and taking care of his men and women on the battlefield. There's no, there's no equation for success in a conflict, but years in military schools always noted the time-tested ingredients and fundamentals for success in a conflict likely include overwhelming maneuver, tempo, the ability to outthink, outdecide, and outact before your opponent can, to concentrate forces with decisive power at critical points in time, and then redeploy for a variety of other missions. These are components that today's operational energy initiatives must work with. As far as the future, the U.S. military is transitioning from over a decade of war to a world that appears to be trending possibly towards greater stability overall, but with things like the A2AD um, concepts and destructive technologies out there that are, can be acquired pretty easily by a wide range of actors. Um, these technologies are not necessarily prohibitively expensive, and they may not cost our enemies a lot in terms of dedicated personnel, training, material, and facilities, and they could be devastating to anyone. As a result, the world is potentially more dangerous than ever before. A concept for dealing with this new security environment is evolving to defend against a very wide range of security challenges, from those in both space and cyberspace, um, from anti-access and aerial denial capabilities that you learned about. Um, and this concept is called global integrated operations. So where I'm going with this thing is that uh, part of Joint Forces 2020 is to be able to conduct something called global integrated operations. And it means that basically we can aggregate forces, um, we can deploy, we can employ, and we can redeploy, and then we can do it all over again. Now, um, the force size could be small, uh, it could be small to large. As a logistician, when you're talking about um, forming, deploying, employing, redeploying, and doing that possibly in smaller size units on a wide variety of geography, that concerns me. Um, and that should concern everybody that works with operational energy. The hardest units I've ever had to support in the past are the little isolated ones that aren't self-sufficient, that are out on their own, on the wings, on the flanks. That is very tough to do. So we have to be thinking about that. And I know the commanders will think about that in their plans. Um, to me, the coming fiscal austerity, the future points to a smaller, more capable force. I have recently read the phrase in some of the joint doctrine, we need to get smaller to get stronger. And I think it's a bullseye. We just won't be able to afford all the necessary capabilities, plus those we're bringing in between now and 2020 for today's larger force construct. So I think it's going to be not only smaller and stronger, but much more capable. I think all the services, all the combatant commands, want more of the operational efficiency on the battlefield. Less energy requirement is less risk to the mission. 
which is measured in lives saved. I think the younger service men and women get operational energy in, intuitively. It's the older ones, the folks that are my age, perhaps the older contractors, that may have a harder challenge. They say that if you're a large organization, you're old and you're tradition-based, it's harder to change. That defines the Marine Corps, and that's some. <laughs> I, I led something called logistics modernization years ago, and I learned a lot about that. Um, There's some very good stories about a Marine Infantry Battalion, the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines, who literally embraced operational and energy initiatives in Afghanistan. 3-5 had the highest combat casualty rate of any unit at that time and to date in the Marine Corps and viewed anything that unleashed their tether to fuel and energy and the large logistics tail that resupplied them as something that increased their survivability. Their use of solar power and renewables um, operating from small tactical patrol bases helped provide the benefits in combat, and that's documented. Um, for my end, in the J4C, just a couple of weeks here, the approach to December 14 and redeployment from Afghanistan and the coming fiscal austerity does have me thinking about the future of logistics. My concern is a very possible and likely target for budget cuts is logistics, especially if manpower and health care costs are not touched. Another concern is that much of the joint logistics capability for ground combat operations is in the Army Reserve and the Army National Guard up to 85% by most accounts. That means it's challenging to activate and deploy and employ reserve water production, fuel distribution, and inland distribution trucking capability within a short time frame, and I'm talking about 60 days, for example. That makes aggregating, deploying, employing, and redeploying challenging. Last I checked, we relied on contractors to do the line haul from door to door in support of Afghanistan. And how much capability do we have in the military? And, is, and it is, is it enough? And how do we fill the gaps in that capability? How, how do we reduce the tether to fossil fuels? That's enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you both very much for that wide-ranging uh, tableau you've painted. I think it gives us lots and lots of opportunity to, uh, to have a good conversation. So if people could walk around and pick up cards, I'm going to exercise the chair's prerogative and pose a couple questions first. Um, Secretary Burke, I wanted to ask you uh, a, a sort of an inside baseball kind of question about how your office is situated and some of the dynamics that General Rourke talked about and what that means for an evolving conversation. So you are part of uh, acquisition technology and logistics. Um, the whole front part of your conversation was essentially about broader defense policy issues that are typically not directly the purview of, of AT&L. And General Rourke, I think, rightly pointed out that Congress tends to be supportive of, m most supportive of these operational energy directly, um, directly tactically applicable kinds of initiatives. So if the opportunity for those kinds of initiatives uh, is going down, or uh, we hope it will go down. Um, how do you how do you position yourself, both of you, uh, to to influence that broader conversation about the the value of some of the installation things that General Rourke uh, has managed before, and I think continues to have some hand in, um, and that you're clearly interested in, but also the policy questions. How does that how, how, do you, how does your office handle that institutional shift um, and, and keep momentum? Um, cookies, cake, <laughs> bribes, no. Um, although I would say um, proselytizing has been a, a lot of our mission and making sure that we can document what the challenge here is and then show it to senior commanders. But one of the big challenges for the office from the beginning, certainly we focused on fielding for Afghanistan and rapid fielding, and, and Bob's been a great partner in that and making improvements in how we are actually operating. But at the same time, we were very much aimed at the future force development from the very beginning and getting into how the department grows the force. And so being in acquisition technology and logistics, was a very helpful place to be for that because it, it is where for the Office of the Secretary of Defense some of those longer term 
issues are being chewed up and decided and, and overseen. So being part of those communities means that you know, we get to play a part in, the, in the, um, the joint staff's requirements definition, and we get to play a part formally on the Defense Acquisition Board. Um, we've been playing in Title X service uh, military department war games and bringing energy in as a consideration to those games. We're playing a part in how acquisition technology and logistics advises the quadrennial defense review and the defense strategic guidance and the classified guidance that comes off of that. Um, so in those longer term issues, it's been extremely helpful and also for innovation. And um, the acting head of the research and engineering department right now is a very good partner for us and we work with him very closely about the best ways to promote innovation in this area. And I think, um, so being an ATNL has been very helpful. Um, as Bob mentioned, also I have put staff in a couple of the combatant commands and spent a lot of time working with them because of course their demand signal for capability, um, their ability to incorporate energy as either a vulnerability or an advantage into their plans and into their exercises is a very important element. So uh, pretty much by a full institutional engagement, in all the key places where these kinds of decisions are being made, uh, we've either had a formal authority or interaction or have certainly engaged extensively. So that you know, we've been targeting the future force development from the very beginning. Uh, I'm sorry, did you want to add to that? Uh, sure. The, uh, I think that, uh, actually, I think there is a tie-in with the installation side. I think a lot of the good initiatives that we take into the uh, operational world um, forward come from some sort of techn science and technology that breaks into the installation piece. Um, the renewables just bring something to the mind. Um, and I also think that uh, the, something, something that we can do on the joint staff to influence um, some of the key performance parameters is, is just start rethinking um, some of the newer initiatives that are coming in, um, newer vehicles like the joint light tactical vehicle or the ground combat vehicle or the placement to the uh, Bradley and things like that. I think instead of just looking at it as one weapon system or one communication system or one um, piece of medical equipment at a time, we really have to look at the entire in the logistics world, I'd call it the supply chain because everybody's always out there trying to maximize the performance in their part of the supply chain, let's say at the wholesaler level at the expense, and they don't realize it, at the expense of someone else. And so I have this happen all the time when I was at CENTCOM and somebody has a better way to get food in the country. And yet the other people that have to fly it say, wait a minute, that's going to cost us three times the amount, da 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 So I think you have to look at the entire effect on fuel, on fossil fuels, on energy, the entire r range of supply. Quite frankly, there's some things out there that, uh, that may appear that they use more fuel, let's say uh, KMAX. An unmanned aerial uh, vehicle, it's an unmanned aerial helicopter, a logging helicopter used in, uh, in RC Southwest. And you may look at that and that's shuttling supplies, unmanned by the way, um, incredible distances in Hellman Province. You may look, oh that's just, you know, it's, well, it, it's using a lot of fuel. Well maybe it's not if you take it all the way back in the supply chain. And then of course it's keeping convoys off the road. And so um, I used to say in maintenance that we have more people tracking maintenance than actually doing maintenance. Now, I didn't really mean that. But it, in the field of energy, I think we just need to add that training piece to our folks that work with fuels. We have a lot of people working with fuels, and with fossil fuels, and with tracking it, moving it, accounting for it every day. And I think we just all we have to do is infuse with them training on how to think about it differently, because they'll force us to think about it differently. Then I can go in and I say, hey, this concept of operations isn't necessarily a bad one. Look at what the whole supply chain is going to look like. It's going to be better for fuel, less fuel in the future. So if I heard you correctly, you're saying all you have to do is institute a culture change? Oh. <laughs> Large, That's it. That's old, and tradition-based. That <laughs> That's going to go smoothly, I'm sure. Um, what are you going to do next year? Um, let me ask you, uh, General Rourke, a, a, a question about some of the things that you think are the most successful in the operational energy space, and then... Um, if you could talk a little bit about the different kinds of initiatives that the different COCOMs are pursuing. Like, what is, are there regional differences um, that matter in this space? Um, 
Obviously, that's an important question. I think the COCOMs are, thanks to Ms. Burke and, and her visits and, uh, and providing us with, with feet on the ground forward and, and lots of food. Marine will do anything for a good donut, so I mean. Um, but uh, I think having people on board to force us to think about it is absolutely imperative. Um, we've already got, you know, for example, on a typical COCOM staff, you've got environmental engineers um, that tell you about how important it is to get rid of burn pits and things like that. Um, the same thing with operational energy. You have to push those initiatives forward. Uh, she's also pushed uh, um, experts out into Afghanistan. So we have some we have some excellent successes out there beyond just the uh, renewable energy for recharging uh, communication batteries and lights and running uh, command posts. Um, you have them actually. You have, uh, if I recall right, uh, in Bagram, I think there's about three 150 set um, camps that are built all about using more <laughs> operational efficient. Uh, tents, camps, messing, um, showers, things like that, and it works, and it's and it's uh, it's the right thing to do because over the years, uh, I well over the years, our living standards for some reason in Iraq and Afghanistan, once we got onto the forward operating bases and the maneuver phases were over, they just kind of crept. It was kind of like a mission creep, uh, it, but it, the standards went up, and we lived really well. the The case case in point is that. Uh, Possibly our, our uh, expeditionary housing sets weren't as energy efficient that they could be. And I'm talking about our force provider and our harvest bayer type sets that two of the services have. So I think that's a great target. And what happened? We just took some good ideas from the commercial world and we implemented them, the Army implemented them, and did a fine job. Same thing with some of their generators. They have a new generator that you can take out a mobile generator that uses about 25% of the power or 25% savings on the power. Um, and when you get when, when you see the op, the base camps, you know there's a lot of a lot of uh, air conditioners and generators out there, and it's a significant saving. So um, I think that uh, the other technology that comes to uh, comes to mind is microgrids, and uh, the fact that uh, and I have to be careful with some of these things. They work really well. Um, when I was a base commander in Iraq of 8,000 people, the most scary operation was not defending the base or or uh, doing those ancillary things associated with security. It was watching someone who I couldn't even talk to, uh, contractors from a you know, different part of the world, didn't speak English, completely rewire an 8,000 person base camp and set up new generators. That was scary, that got my hair on fire. Not literally, but um, <laughs> it actually, but I think that that's, uh, that's all related there. We're, we're, we're growing in leaps and bounds and what we can do. We have to be a little cautious that some of these technologies that come in, like micro, um, the microgrids and things like that, will need some specially trained people, and that'll that'll be a cost somewhere in our in our training pipeline. But. All right, um, Scott Mann is going to help us with questions along with Andrew Metric. So, Scott, go ahead. Great. Um, so, I've got a number of questions here that deal with with natural gas, but I want to start a little bit broader and look at. The innovations that you see, you've talked talk about innovation. Innovations you see in the next five to ten years that you think will be the most influential, most important. Um, and then what role do you see for natural gas in, in some of the platforms, sh naval ships, for example, installations? Um, and then sort of on the innovation piece, um, one example that's been put forward well is advanced batteries. So, so where, will those, where will those fall in? Yeah, you know, one thing that we've really tried to do that the joint staff has been very helpful on is is not so much uh, put the technology as the, you know, the cart in front of the horse, in that I, I don't want to fall in love with any given end use or supply technology or resource. Um, I want it to be driven by what we have to do. So the question is, how do we incorporate this into our strategy development and our planning and our requirements? How do we incorporate energy innovation into that so that there's a demand signal rather than, I really love solar, so therefore it's the answer to every question. And I do love solar, let me tell you. <laughs> um, so that, I realize that that's not a very satisfying answer, and I'll give you a more direct one. But that's the real challenge for us, is to create a demand signal for that kind of innovation, not to pick a winner. Um, and that is where DOD has its strongest innovation advantage, is that kind of demand signal, not by picking a technology winner, but by picking a problem that we have to solve. So you know, in, in terms of that and the problems we have to solve, we need better soldier power or warrior power, right, at the individual level. So that means better batteries. Yes, we're looking at battery innovation. Um, we're looking at other ways to generate power, whether it's a kinetic sort of power generation. 
um, but also how to need less. How do you, you know, your, your iPhone's pretty aggressive about how it manages energy. We don't usually put that in our requirements, so lo and behold, we don't always get it, or maybe never. Um, so we're going to look at the, at the individual level. And then at the contingency base level, uh, Bob talked about some of the changes there. Um, there's a lot of room for improvement there. If we could get to a net zero capability where we can support uh, certainly a combat outpost without having to, to uh, truck in energy or out waste, that would be highly advantageous for all kinds of missions. And we've got a lot of uh, innovation in that area that includes things like microgrids and tactical solar um, waste to energy. Lots of technologies there where we've got investments, some which are near term and going in now, some which are longer term. Uh, my office even has some investments in there in, in some very innovative cooling and heating technologies that will really decrease the demand for, for that kind of power. Uh, so then there's the big movers. So the airplanes and the ships and the combat vehicles. Um, today, about 90% of the department's investments in improving operational energy are in that space. They're in propulsion, engine efficiency, uh, materials. So about how you move those big movers better, faster, more efficiently. And it doesn't take much to get big savings. So those are very important investments. And then I would characterize there's a fourth area. Um, and, and by the way, there are, there are things across here like energy storage, where we have some investments that I think are very promising. We have some weapons that require a lot of pulse power. Energy storage is going to be an important part of that going forward. And it's also a part of the resilience at our bases. But the last category is sort of, um, I would say, completely new systems. So unmanned systems, for example, can be a really significant change in your energy profile, both in terms of the amount of energy they require to operate as opposed to manned systems performing those functions. But they also sometimes have a lot more flexibility for the kind of energy. So we're looking, we're experimenting with fuel cells, with solar panels, um, with a range of different kinds of powering options for unmanned systems underwater, on the surface, um, in the air. So, you know, that's the full range of kinds of things, and we're seeing everything from energy storage to tactical solar to better batteries um, to better propulsion, better airframes um, being pretty meaningful in that space. Um, the, uh, I think a lot about deploying forces, and. Uh, there's uh, in in uh, I think uh, one of the biggest ways we can we can uh, address operational energy and efficiency is to think uh, hard about that and what can we do to ease the burden of of rapidly deploying and aggregating and employing and then disaggregating and all that and I think there's um, I think that all that has to do with preparing the theater whether in the European Command Cent Central Command Pacific Command particularly the Pacific commands uh, because of the rebalance there is such a broad theater and any and a lot of that has to do with uh, key leader engagement and access access is so crucial in logistics um, and I used to love watching the transcom commander go into different parts of and I can't tell you where but different parts of central command of the 20 countries he always came back with some sort of permission whether it was overflight or ground line of communication every time he went I tried to get him to go more um, but I think I, once a quarter would wear him out, but he was just fantastic. Um, good things come with key leader engagement and access. Things like ability potentially to preposition supplies. Um, and now a lot of the times when we, we deploy to a country or we, or we can, can preposition things or we can conduct exercises out of there, maybe not have a permanent presence, um, we rely, of course, on host nation contracting. Um, I think we need to develop better skills in our contracting specialists, and we've grown the capability a lot. We're still not there yet, but, I mean, you read all the reports I read about contracting with the enemy in Afghanistan, and we're, we've got a full court press on that. It, nothing's 100 uh, percent perfect, but there's a tremendous amount of attention um, with recent reports from the General Accounting Office, Commission on Wartime Contracting, and the uh, um, Special Inspector for uh, Afghan Reconstruction that have driven us to do the right thing and are continuing to drive us. The more we can preposition, the more we can write it into host nation contracts about things like operational energy. And let's face it, if we've got a warehouse that's in 130 degree weather in the middle of the summer, there's a lot, there's a lot of advantages to operational energy and we will pay less if we are paying the bill. So. And I, natural gas, you said you had a lot of questions on. I didn't mean to duck it. I'm, um, I just forgot. Um, 
natural gas, as far as we get asked a lot, is the department going to be switching over to natural gas for our vehicles or our airplanes? You know, again, our big consumers are ships, airplanes, vehicles. No. Here's why. Um, three reasons. One is uh, logistics of, of fuel is very important. We're buying about 60 percent of our fuel overseas. We want to buy our energy as close as we can to the place where we're operating. So we need something that's universally available. Natural gas is not. Um, and again, a lot of our operations are not in the United States. Um, so logistics is one reason. Another reason is that um, our is the properties of natural gas. Uh, compressed natural gas in a combat environment where it's going, where it may be shot at or blown up, not a great idea. That's the, so the technologies right now that are in the civilian sector will not translate well to a combat environment. However, I will say that the, um, pretty much all defense equipment at this point is certified to use gas to liquid as a potential fuel source. Uh, we are able to use that blended with oil right now. If someone can sell it to us at a price we can afford, we can use it. So that, and, and that's the third answer, is that our, our force and a lot of our, the volume of our consumption is in aircraft especially, but also in ships and, and vehicles, uh, combat vehicles we're talking about here. Um, our force is built to use liquid fuels. It's designed to use liquid fuels. Modifying it to use something else would be extremely expensive. Um, but again, gas to liquid is a possibility um, out there. So that's the, the natural gas story for us. Uh, let me interject one quick question here for both of you, since General Rourke, you, you alluded to it somewhat. Um, what is the role of operational energy and, and energy writ large in partner capacity building? Um, I mean, again, General Rourke, you talked about the access issue, but um, does it have a sort of a, a unique role to play in that space that's become a real priority for us? Um, I, I certainly think it does. Um, when uh, we, we're operating on foreign soil, um, whether we're doing just um, security cooperation, um, we're doing uh, perhaps exercises, um, we are going to be in contact with the host nation logisticians. Uh, it won't necessarily just be the husbanding agents uh, with the, work with the U.S. Navy when we pull in the port, but it'll be a host of people, and they're going to—they're certainly going to want to know um, what we want to do, and and then they're going to offer to do it for us, um, possibly, hopefully, if if possible. So I, I think our, I think our role, um, particularly uh, in building capacity has to do with those relationships. Uh, that's why we go to things like uh, engagements, and I think I, was, I spoke at several logistics conferences for our allies uh, um, while I was in CENTCOM. And I, th I think it has a huge role because that's how you, stab you establish the low-level cooperation. Um, you know, it, we have to have workarounds. We have to have flexibility in our logistics pipeline. And not just by air, because as we mentioned earlier, air is, is, is incredibly expensive. Um, we bring you know, we, we're, like, Afghanistan is a landlocked country, so we use a lot of air to get in there. But we still go by the normal 90 percent sea lift is our objective to try to get things into theater. When we can't, when certain, uh, and, and CENTCOM, quite frankly, I think everybody knows it has three very strategic choke points. It has the Suez Canal, Bab el Mendeb, down by the Red Sea in Djibouti, and it also has the Straits of Hormuz. So if any of those are cut off, we obviously have to have plans to work around that. Um, if you've ever tried to work uh, through customs in some of these Gulf countries, there we go. <laughs> it's a challenge if you don't practice it. Miss um, Burke mentioned war games. Uh, that was one I kept pushing for to be practiced. Okay, we have to force us to get on the roads and try to do these convoys within some of these um, countries that are that are landlocked or, or linked together, I should say. And it's a, it's a capacity building exercise, and we were able to do it. Um, we've uh, you know, in 2008, when all of a sudden the PAC G-locks were closed on us, uh, I think that was the first time, or, or getting very precarious, let me put it that way, because I think there was three different closures. Um, General Dempsey, who was the acting CENTCOM commander at the time, said, let's establish a northern distribution network. Now, no one, no, no one in my fields knew what a northern distribution network was. Uh, however, everybody in Russia and everybody in Eastern Europe and everybody in Central Asia knew what it was because these were the Marco Polo routes, the time-tested routes for sending logistics in. So we, we got a bunch of four stars and State Department personnel and people that were familiar with the countries on the road, 
and they established that uh, the initial beginnings of, of being able to use that uh, incredible three, 4,000 mile northern distribution network. And by the way, there's multiple routes on there and they go through multiple countries. Um, and so uh, my biggest concern, to be quite frank with you, is all the good things that we've established and the relationships with countries that have happened because of um, Operation Enduring Freedom um, could be at risk if we don't continue to move things and continue that transport strategy um, by ground particularly. And by the way, um, there's some aerial overflight, airspace overflight permissions as well that, uh, and all this is, I would say, temporary in nature, but we need to continue that. And I think that's all about ca capacity building because once you can get those permissions, then the other things come, the security cooperation, the, the, uh, the joint training, the joint combined training and those kind of things. And that's just crucial for relationships and establishing that. So I, I learned a lot just watching that at, at CENTCOM and that's uh, On the partnership front, I'd say, I'd echo what Bob said that access for energy to move is, a, is often a common interest that we share with many partners um, all over the world. And again, as I said in my, opening about the geopolitics of this, that interest is growing for our partners. Um, they're more directly invested now than they've ever been before. Um, so that continues to be one. And also, I think um, one of the things that's certainly obvious is that there's a link between stability and energy, uh, both for consumers and producers. And that is a partnership cooperation activity for us. And then, you know, the, the combatant commands all have their theater engagement strategies and they develop relationships with the countries in their areas. And energy can be an avenue for developing those kinds of cooperative relationships, um, whether it's, you know, um, showing what we can do with some of our new technologies, with shelters, um, with, with energy efficiency, with building some of those capabilities in our partners. Um, or just, we often are, I mean, we are, you know, the great secret of U.S. forces, or not so secret, sometimes it seems secret, is, is our, we have a very strong comparative advantage in logistics. So often, if we're going to develop capability with our partner nations all over the world, and that full range of partners, that's an area where they're going to be very interested in what we can do together. So this is energy logistics and energy as a stabilizer, energy as, as a um, force multiplier is something that partners are often in, uh, interested in and is part of a number of the theater engagement plans across the COCOM universe. So, so there's been a series of questions that have focused on the flashpoints and global forcers for some of the energy markets. So how is the DOD looking to mitigate some of the risk that comes from things such as closures of the uh, Straits of Malacca or the Straits of Hormuz or potentially some of the risks that come from climate change? Um, well, um, I'll do my best here on this one. <laughs> um, we, uh, I, I think, I think uh, what you mentioned is, is uh, very practical. It's uh, something that certainly uh, we don't want to happen. Um, and I, I have no idea what the future is, but you have to be ready for it in our business. Otherwise, um, you're in trouble. So I think that uh, you have to have that continual ability to have reliable and redundant lines of communications on that. To do that, it can be challenging in that, in that world we live in where the relationships are, it may not be so good. And even then, um, like we have in Afghanistan, we have customs challenges. And so if you're moving between countries and you're trying to accomplish things that way, it can be a real challenge. But um, I think that uh, if, if there are plan, if, if any, we lose any of those strategic choke points, it's gonna be an impact, there's no question about it. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to potentially force reliance on other ports, other airfields, other locations, which I'm not about to go into, uh, so I can stay out of trouble. <laughs> but I, I think that uh, we, we absolutely have to have plans. Now, along those lines, um, I kind of mentioned earlier what, what I think is, is a part of preparing the theater. If you, those, those strategic tool points you mentioned are not going to change. Straits of Malacca, Straits of Hormuz, Bob, Bob Almendeb, Suez Canal, those kind of things are just not going to change. And so it's, 
it's imperative upon us, and, and I mean us, meaning the interagency, the U.S. government interagency, to conduct those key leader engagements um, that have to be continual, and we have to have a presence in those countries with embassies, security cooperation, and those kind of things, to establish the relationships, the low-level cooperations. It could start with something as simple as an acquisition and cross-servicing agreement, or an equal value exchange agreement, or mutual logistics support agreements. But we have to have those established, so if we have to deploy to those areas, we can leverage host nation support, particularly if we have some reserve capabilities that can't be called up fast enough. So probably my best shot at it. I think um, for, for the flashpoints and, and whether it's you know, freedom of movement of, of, of energy through Strait of Hormuz or the ways in which climate change is affecting uh, security around the world, um, you, know, you go back to what our Title X mission is as a department, which is you know, to organize, train, and equip for the national defense, and then the underlying assumption is to understand, to understand what it is we're organizing, training, and equipping for. So I think energy and, and climate as well, that uh, that's what we need to do, is we need to understand the way in which these resources and these consequences affect our security and global security and our interests. Um, and then organize and then incorporate that understanding into how we are organized, trained, and equipped to deal with it. And, um, you know, that's, that's going to require, um, it's, it's not anything new in some ways. We've always done that. When we waged the Cold War, we weren't just counting missiles, right? We were understanding the economics of the situation and the politics. You have to understand the whole crosscut and how it shapes the strategic environment. So I think it's the same when it comes to um, energy security and to climate change and how those factors shape the environment. And then there are going to be very tangible results from that. So for example, if a country such as Iran is developing the means to control or, or hurt access, we need to understand that capability and we need to have a material ability to deal with it. Um, or we need to find partners who do. We need to incorporate that into our training and our exercises when we do war games, we can't just fairy dust that out, is what I think Admiral Locklear is the term, that, the technical term he uses, is a fairy dust. We can't, we often do that, by the way, when we do scenarios, we assume the logistics and we assume that they will be okay. Can't do that anymore. We need to test those assumptions. So that's part of understanding is to, to do the analysis on what the world looks like and what we think it's gonna look like and then to bring the threats and the challenges and the opportunities in a more honest way into how we're planning and how we're looking at the world and then carry that through into how we organize, train, and equip, so. And I, I think too, one of the first war games I walked into, the, uh, uh, it actually was, uh, was a scenario that happened later on. They, they closed down the Pakistan lines of communications. Well, my fourth month in the job, Day after Thanksgiving, 2011, I woke up, looked at the paper at 6:30. It said Pack G Lock supply route shut down. I thought it was some joke somebody was playing on. I had to, See if you I, were awake during that they game. They never, right? they never do that. Actually, get the exercise right. They... We had, we had actually kind of, we'd, we'd go through that so many times. So, um, and uh, fortunately, we were able to deal that. We had enough mitigation factors in place because it wasn't completely a surprise, but it was. Uh, it, you know, it took three to four months of planning ahead of time to do that. And so that's why I think what you're saying makes uh, absolute great sense. That's a, that's a planner's approach to everything, is assume it's going to happen and then plan for it beforehand. If directions a little bit to the, to the cultural change piece, um, looking at, is this pr primarily going to be a top-down or a bottom-up sort of um, initiative, and, and what should the balance be? What's going to be the most, most influential for long-term success, particularly in, in places in offices in the military where turnover is high and you get new commanders every few years and try and institute that change at a sort of organic level? It, Bob has to talk about it because, um, because I, I think as, a, you know, as an office of the Secretary of Defense office, my role is policy guidance and oversight. And I can influence culture and culture change, but I don't own it. The military departments own their culture. And um, a couple things that, that I would say about that is that it has to be top down and bottom up, of course. Can't do it without leadership, and you can't do it without convincing the people that have to <coughs> execute it that it's worth it for them, and that it's worth it for war fighting, right? It's not just eat your broccoli, 
It's that this is going to be better for the mission and for the capability. I mean, I think that's the heart of culture change. And I don't personally love the culture change term because I think a lot of times the, what you want to see happen is already within the culture. And the burden's on us to find where it makes sense. So for example, uh, if you talk to uh, someone who flies F-18s um, and you say, you don't know anything about fuel management. Well, yes, they do. Okay, they manage fuel very aggressively. They dump it too, so you know <laughs> it's not perfect. But they, but they, management of fuel is already very much part of their culture. So it's not a question of telling them you're bad, wrong, and stupid, and you need to change. It's finding where what they do makes sense, and then moving it into the next step. But you get to be the owner of culture change. So I had a very painful couple of years in the Marine Corps doing that. Uh, tried to change. Uh, we had a lot of lessons after after uh, OAF one, uh, the Army and the Marine Corps. Uh, we Basically, whenever you're trying to support a 550-mile maneuver effort, trying to do that in a lightning breakneck speed pace with organic forces, it can be very tough. Um, and so we, uh, the kind of the lessons we learned is that uh, besides being large, large, old, and tradition-based and not wanting to change and liking the systems you have, um, ultimately what happens, one of, the, one of the parameters is we finally got smart and said, okay, we need to bring the Commandant of the Marine Corps in, do a video, get it out to people saying, I support logistic modernization, which means new IT, new training, new way of thinking. And um, he did. And life got a lot easier after that happened. <laughs> Rule number one is, uh, is always that I think the, uh, the, the leader, and in particularly in the service culture, uh, um, has, to, has to get up and say he supports it and then dedicate it. Now, he's He's got to. He's got to make sure we have to convince him if we are going to change that. Um, like I said, those in my opening statement, we can't compromise, compromise uh, operational effectiveness whatsoever. So it, it has to be a good initiative. Has to be proven, and most of many of them are. I wouldn't say most of them, been, but but I think if it if it reduces your tether to energy, it's going to reduce the operational risk of the maneuver commander, and it's going to keep his folks on the battlefield longer. Therefore, they can accomplish their mission, whatever it is, whether it's humanitarian assistance, disaster relief, stability ops, peacekeeping ops, or at the high end of, of combat operations. He has a better chance of accomplishing that. So I think that's what it's all about on this thing. And I think um, while you were in the seat at CENTCOM, I think General Allen actually put out a fragmentary order on this. Um, and one of the things that was clear in it was that he wanted the forces under his command to understand that the the operational energy piece was a capability issue and that using less meant someone didn't have to bring them fuel over a battlefield and put their lives at risk. So he put that very much out there. And then also, I don't know if you've heard this yet because you luckily this happened after you left CENTCOM, but there's a base in Afghanistan that's had one of its big turbines go down. And that means that they've got power shortages on the base. And all of a sudden they've had to think in terms of critical missions, what absolutely has to be supported and they put out, you know, a message to the whole base saying, we need you to use less for this reason. And people did. And they found there were a lot of places where there were buildings that they could disconnect, the water heaters and the HVAC, and, and could actually save energy. And they found they were able to manage their, their shortfall just by people making a change. So when you give people a reason and you tell them why it matters, and then you give them the tools to make a change, they change. The, uh, just some of my folks have told me the last couple of weeks that, uh, not surprisingly, know, knowing General Allen, um, when he got to theater, uh, beginning of his tour, he was frustrated with so much logistics on the battlefield. And really what he meant was in the, in the, in the different types of bases, large to small. It's incredible. Um, and uh, he didn't really know how to control the demand signal. So he didn't, and so um, I wish he could have seen, because he kind of started the whole focus on, on retrograde and push, starting to push things out of theater as our forces drew down and reduce the fuel consumption requirement. Incidentally, one of the things that concerned me is one of our, as we started withdrawing forces in the beginning, retrograding forces, redeploying them, I should say, um, the, the next demand signal I got for fuel went up. <laughs> I was about great. I could not believe it. Can you believe something like that happened? So I questioned it. I said, and we have two sources. We have a, um, a NATO source for fuel and we have Defense Logistics Agency. And so um, those kind of things will happen. But, the co but over, the, over time, I think what happened was, once, as we were talking about change and culture change earlier, uh, it's the commander that's got to get out there and say, we're going to change. And uh, the commander there 
has said that we're going to change. We're going to reduce contractors in theater. We're going to reduce the fuel requirement. We don't need to hold 60 days of supply of fuel. We're, we can reduce that. We can reduce food. We can eat less hot meals in the mess hall. We can go to two from four a day. Um, and all that, all that took the commander to say that because a lot of that stuff hit the social media right away. <laughs> that was interesting. But <laughs> I'm only getting two hot meals instead of four. <laughs> and, but uh, bottom line is, again, it's the culture thing and, it, and it, leadership starts at the top. So. Evidence from uh, for financially for, for operational energy. How has fiscal austerity affected your office and the initiatives that you're undertaking and, and, and what is the out, outlook? Um, we don't entirely know yet um, because we're still really still sorting through the impacts of sequestration on the fiscal year 13 and 14 potentially uh, budgets. So, but the best we can tell, there's two answers to that question. Uh, one is, of course, it affects these energy initiatives because it affects everything. And because of the nature of the sequester, the timing and which accounts you can target, there are only certain places you can go. And you know, my, my boss, Frank Kendall, the undersecretary, has said this quite a bit, has been making it clear publicly that it disproportionately means that you target procurement and modernization accounts. Well, a lot of our energy improvements are going to be in those accounts. So there's no question that the, the sequester in particular, because of the handcuffs it puts on the department, are, are going to affect our investments in these initiatives. However, at the end of the day, we're still going to be a, what, $450 billion base budget organization that's still defending the country. We're still going to be buying equipment. We're still going to be deploying people. We're still going to be in bases around the world. And so the question is not, is that initiative still going to be funded? But what we do buy, are we going to consider energy performance and energy flexibility and then and energy security and threats in how we actually buy and operate? So that's, that's what a lot of the institutional change that the J4, the Joint Staff, and my office have been, really been pushing is so that it's not about what you're going to have to take off the table to comply with sequestration. It's about what you, how you do what you are doing, and is it taking energy into account? And that's, you know, and yes, it will. And earlier in the conversation, there was discussions about how there's a good portion of the logistics force is in the National Guard and the Reserve, and it takes a while to spin up. So sort of part of that we saw in Iraq was that there was it took a while to do some of the post-conflict reconstruction things like specifically rebuild power plants water facilities and that potentially had an impact on the insurgency in iraq and sort of getting restoring a sense of normalcy within the country what are any any initiatives within the operational energy space that look to sort of improve our ability to do that sort of that sort of work in those spaces and then any sort of civil military cooperation that might be involved in that engineering work. That's a good one. <laughs> That's a very good question. Um, the, uh, we, uh, we have a pretty, um, we, we still have construction to do even after 2014, as you well mentioned, um, in Afghanistan. And, uh, I think uh, a lot of that is uh, is probably under the Department of State portfolio, and of course it has to do um, with, um, I guess you would say, the, uh, the energy grid, power grid, the uh, water distribution, particularly irrigation projects with dams, and some of the important resources that Afghanistan has. Um, it's a good question because I, quite frankly, because that doesn't come through Department of Defense, we just watch it to make sure it's funded. I can't really uh, tell you, we can take that one on, but I can't really tell you what is being done regarding energy efficiency with that. Uh, fortunately or unfortunately, we don't actually keep a record, so you don't have to submit that one for the record. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, good. You're I'm off used, the hook. You tell I'm used to be in front of you. <laughs> But I do think um, one of the ways that we can deal with that is, I mean, the, the department's at a grand reckoning moment, right? We're rethinking our strategy. We, we're rethinking our plans. We're rethinking our equipping. Um, so you've got to incorporate those kinds of, of dynamics into your strategy and your plans and your equipping. 
including uh, whole of government efforts in that, you know, the military is not the right tool for every situation, but we need to make sure that the tools that we need are there. And I, you know, that's been a big part of the story of the last 12 years. Um, and so that's got to be part of the answer too, that if we need something, if we determine that in our strategy and our plans, then that needs to be a broader discussion across government. Can I pull the thread on that a little bit? Because you, you talked about the link between energy and security and, and how it goes both ways. Um, and that was, that has been one of the biggest challenges we've faced in both Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, are there structural things that need to change? Are we, um, are we, are we optimized to deal with that challenge? Um, because it's a, it's a perpetual friction point. Um, what could we do? And, and how broadly are we able to think about that? I, I, I think it is something we need to think about. And when you say, are we structured to do it? Um, I, I think we can. I think we have planning processes and strategy development processes that allow us the flexibility to bring in um, outside influences. I mean, we, the department's been talking about how all these other influences affect defense interests for some time. And now it's just a question of actually getting it into our planning process in a material way. So for example, you know, my office is supporting a study to look at uh, North Korea and to look at, you know, should there be a contingency there, whether it's a humanitarian question, a governance change, or actual combat, what are the energy needs going to be there in some kind of post you know, phase four, phase five world, whatever the reason is, what are the energy needs going to be, particularly if you are in a humanitarian disaster situation where there's immediate needs to help the population? What's already there? What's the requirement going to be? And how are we incorporating that? How are the South Koreans incorporating that into their preparedness and their readiness? Um, so those are the kinds of questions I think we do need to be asking and, and that uh, can be on the table at this point. I think, too, that uh, there's there's certainly room for it. I think you have to be careful in some of these countries where, where, uh, where the State Department uh, is taking the lead on things, that uh, we've got to make sure that we're not building something that can only be maintained by the, you know, by the, Agreed. you know, by the only certain people in this world. So I think we have to, that's one of the challenges we had in Afghanistan, matter of fact, is for every, every military construction project um, or um, USAID construction project we had, um, you had to build a force to maintain that. And so I, that's been a big focus of doing that. And uh, that's why it's such a good question, because if you're throwing a microgrid in there, it may not have anybody to repair it. And, uh, you, and the whole idea is to, in a counterinsurgency is to uh, help out that nation and get their people to work and get the economy going and be self-sufficient. So. Again, uh, it's thinking about it in advance and understanding what the needs are and also when you need to bring in another agency. And so you can look even in the United States at <coughs> relief efforts from Hurricane Sandy. Um, defense personnel moved something like 10 million gallons of fuel um, and helped restore power to 50,000 people. We can do that because we can do just about anything. Um, but that's not necessarily the way that this country is going to want to use its military. Um, so, but that requires building resilience in your civilian community and making certain kinds of investments in your first responders. And that requires us to understand the challenges better. So, I mean, I think that's part and parcel of what's going on now. It doesn't happen very often, but we, you've beaten them into submission, apparently. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me thank you both so much for taking the time to come over. We really appreciate it. It was great to have you.